Good afternoon. Hope everyone's doing well today. Uh, glad there's such a crowd here. Um, feel free to uh, uh, come up if you have any questions. We've got a microphone right over here. I'm happy to take questions throughout the presentation uh, as well as at the end, but they do ask that you come up so that you can get uh, your question on the recording and so everyone can hear. Or when it's out, if you shout it out, if you're in the back, I'll just uh, try and repeat it for everybody. My name is John Moss. Uh, my information is right up here. Feel free to uh, give me a message on Twitter uh, or head over to my website. I'm a, the, I'm a fourth grade teacher in Avon, Connecticut. Um, our school's uh, partially official educational technology leader. Uh, and I do a little bit of work uh, at the district level on a variety of different topics. I'm also, this summer, a uh, activity director at a summer camp called Renberg Summer Adventure, where I'm working with middle school and high school students, which is really interesting for me, because now that's given me an opportunity to take the work that I'm doing at the elementary level, mix it with some of the work from the intermediate and the secondary level, uh, and put that along with the work that I do with adults, with my fellow teachers on professional development pieces. Today we're really taking a look at using WordPress to make classroom or school websites, but we're not limited exclusively to WordPress. I know since you're all here, hopefully you're all uh, committed to WordPress, but a lot of what I'm going to cover is applicable to any number of different web situations. Just so I can get an idea of uh, what our audience is. Can I get a show of hands of who here is a teacher or a uh, K-12 technology uh, representative? All right, so we've got a good collection here. People who are at the higher education level. People who are developers. All right, so we've got a really good assortment of folks here. A lot, uh, especially if you're at the K-12 level or even at the uh, uh, higher education level, your organization may have some specific requirements as to what you use. And WordPress may be something that your organization has adopted. Maybe you're trying to get them to adopt it, which is where I am right now. Or maybe they've already made a decision and they're going with something else. And hopefully this will be ap applicable to any number of uh, situations. I want to take you through some of my history with a school website here. Uh, my very first website when I started teaching was uh, right over here. It's the School Notes site. I started using that uh, when I started teaching. Uh, I'm going into my ninth year in my district. I uh, use School Notes primarily as a system for managing classroom websites. And it was one of those basic one-page websites. And I really wanted to have something. Oops. I really wanted to have something where I could have almost a blog style of interface. And so basically, I took the one page, and I just kept adding more and more text to it to make an artificial <laughs> blog. It actually, on more than a few occasions, crashed the uh, school notes site. And I had to call them up and say, can you restore my site? And eventually they said, no, actually we can't. It apparently crashed it so badly that it ruined their archives. And that's when I very quickly realized that school notes was not going to meet my needs. And I was very happy to part ways with school notes. My next foray, foray into uh, class websites was using a platform called Plogger Lifetype. Uh, I used that for, I think, about five years, actually. You'll notice that the picture is a little distorted. This is actually the only evidence remaining of this particular site. <laughs> I, I, I had a couple of unfortunate experiences with the site. It worked very well for me, but it was very basic. You could blog with it, and that was about it. And at one point, uh, the co hosting company that I was using had me on a server with another user who left a security vulnerability. And my website, which had activities and assignments for third graders, uh, was replaced with a website from an extremist group uh, posting some rather inappropriate images all over my website for third graders. <laughs> so after getting uh, somewhat stressed with the hosting company, we quickly got my website restored, and then I very quickly abandoned them moved elsewhere. I did, however, learn another important lesson, other than choose your hosting site very carefully. It, this happened to be convenient timing. It was right around when I was moving to fourth grade, and I had a lot of resources on this site. I had a lot of materials, photos, and I wanted to leave it online as a legacy site, even though as I was doing this transition to a new hosting company, I did make the decision to create a new site. 
I left this one active on my uh, on my uh, server just so that people could get to it. And what I I guess I assumed at the back of my head was, well, I'm not posting to it anymore. It's just going to kind of stay sandboxed, and nothing's ever going to happen, which means I haven't logged in in three years or updated the software for it in three years, which means that when it got hacked again recently, it just, I took it down. Uh, it was time to say goodbye to it. So the lesson learned is if you have a site that you're leaving up for legacy access, even if you're not continuing to post to it, it still is really important that you're continuing to maintain this uh, software on it to make sure that you're applying any security patches that are available. So finally, when I moved to fourth grade, I joined WordPress, and I saw the light. And here I am now with WordPress. And I'm going to show you a few different pieces of my class website a little bit later on. There are some key distinctions between what I think a, a school website or class website is and how WordPress can be used for other platforms, whether it's in the commercial setting or social setting. There are a few different distinctions. One key piece is that your clientele is handed to you. You, you have a nearly captive audience. In my case, my clientele primarily are the families of my students and my students themselves. They're in my class. They don't have a choice about whether or not they're in my class. So right off the bat, I'm not as focused on drawing in new readers to my site or new visitors. In fact, sometimes my focus is I don't want new visitors. I really want to limit this to my target group. So that's one key distinction between a class website and a more general website. You're not as uh, focused on drawing in the readers here. At the same time, your website uh, may have some significant restrictions on the content that you can put onto your site, as well as the design elements. Your district may have requirements for what information must be on your class website, and it may have some restrictions that you may not be allowed to post student photos, or you may not be allowed to put uh, student work pieces or names on your website. And these are things that you need to uh, dedicate yourself to figuring out in advance of creating your website, because that also guide you quite a bit. Privacy restrictions were a big challenge for me because my website was very visual. I like to have a lot of photos on my website of what we were doing. I thought that, that was very important to keep parents informed of what was going on in their child's classroom. But it's hard when you have three or four students where the parents have uh, restricted the use of their students' photos. It's hard to shoot around them without making those kids feel as if they're being uh, uh, ignored. So that, that was an ongoing challenge for me for many years. And what's happened to my setup here? Time machine, oh dear. Thank you, time machine. Uh, the other piece of it is that you may have a hard launch deadline. If you're redefining your website, here we are during the summer, if you're making a new class website for the coming school year, you have a hard deadline. Clearly that's something that's unique to teachers and developers and designers have no idea what it's like to have a hard deadline that you can't be flexible with. That's just, that's just teachers. <laughs> So there are a couple of decisions that you need to make when you're creating your own class website or your own school website. One key thing is how often do you expect to update that website? And that has an effect for two reasons. First of all, that'll help you to decide if you want a static or a dynamic website. When I say static, I mean a site that you're building by hand using a program like Dreamweaver or something else where you're coding it or you're doing page by page and you're editing those pages individually. That's fine if it's something where it's pretty much going to stay the same. But if you're going to want to have more ongoing updates for your website, you're going to want something more dynamic, where you type in an update and the system itself will update the appearance of the pages. You're just focusing on the content. And really, that's what WordPress can do for you. But we're also talking about how often you're going to post information. Is your site going to be something where you're just going to put on in the September your class schedule, your grading policies, your homework policies, things like that? and then leave it for the entire year? Or is it something that you could update throughout the year with information on projects, with information on what's going on in your classroom, more of a blog style? You have to make that decision before you decide on what website platform you're going to adopt. What content do you intend to share on your website? Is it going to be mostly text, articles, and lists? Or is it going to be more uh, multimedia, videos of what's going on in your room, photos, a mix of both, recordings? I'm doing, right now with my summer program, I'm doing a lot of multimedia sharing on our camp website. And that's a very different style than what I'm used to during the school year. Another decision you have to figure out is what is your target audience, especially when you go to choose the theme of your website, you need to make that decision. If you're, uh, let's say, a second grade teacher and your target audience is the second grade students, 
That website may have a very casual, fun kids environment, a uh, kids look to it, whereas if your target audience is the parents of those students, you may want something a little more professional, a little more refined. So it really depends on what your goal is. And it's important that you decide. Sometimes you can have a target audience that's both, and you choose a theme that can kind of work for both settings. But it's really important to make that decision ahead of time. You have to decide, are you going to invite discussion? WordPress is big on conversing, having comments. There are forums and discussion groups that you can put into WordPress. We've got BuddyPress as another option. But uh, if you're a classroom teacher, you may not want to have a lot of discussion. You may find that that's a liability if you have students discussing things on your website. If you put an assignment up there and information and you allow comments, what do you do about the parent who posts that comment about, why are you giving this assignment? Why are you having this deadline? That's awfully unfair. This is really strict. Why are you doing this? Why aren't you taking into account certain things? And then you get into a slippery slope of, You've got a parent making some comments that you're not comfortable with, but yet do you want to get into the role of censoring a public discussion? Oftentimes it may be easier to limit comments and limit discussion and then to ease, in, uh, ease those restrictions when you're ready to do so. You need to decide what platform is right for you. You're all here, so I'm hoping WordPress is of interest to you, but there are plenty of sites that you can use to make your own class website. Actually, blogs, school notes. You saw school notes at the beginning. You know my feeling there. Uh, your school may have a platform that they sponsor. Do we have anyone here who uses first class in their organization? All right, one. Well, we're, we're there too. We're moving away from first class websites, but uh, I'm right there with you. And so your organization may require that you use a particular platform. You may decide to self-host yours. And if you self-host it, that doesn't close the door, of course, on using WordPress. WordPress.org is a great opportunity, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment here. All right, so you do have those two options. There's WordPress.com and WordPress.org, and they both have some distinctions here. WordPress.com is free to all users. WordPress.org is also, but you have to find a hosting service. WordPress does offer some limited support available to users, and of course, there's a vast repository of information online, and it is more turnkey. You register, you put in your information, you've got your website with Hello World right at the top, and you're ready to go. You do have some restrictions on content. You're limited on whether you can market on your website. You're limited in terms of how big your uh, uploads can be. If you've got a larger piece that you want to make available, you may find that that's a bit restrictive. WordPress.org, on the other hand, you can create your own site. Uh, you can have your own domain, uh, both literally and figuratively. You can register your own domain and make it into your own online domain for yourself. You can also, of course, purchase a domain to point toward a WordPress.com website, and that's something I always recommend to teachers to make it easy for the students. You have the potential of more storage space for multimedia uploads, and that's great because not only does that give you flexibility within WordPress, but if you've got a big 100 megabyte file that for some reason you really need to put onto your site and have uh, shared with parents available for download, you have that capability when you're hosting your own site. To be clear, that doesn't mean you have to have your own server. It means if you're using a hosting company to host your website that you're paying directly. You also have much more room and uh, control, room for growth for your site. You can go in other directions. You can have, for example, your, uh, your own uh, WordPress installations for other topics. You can bring in other platforms, other kinds of sites. You just, again, have that flexibility to go in different directions. You're not locked into one particular piece. WordPress.org also gives you more themes uh, that you can choose from. So there are a lot of advantages to both of them, and you really need to choose which one is right for you. You do have to have more independence and skill, however, if you're self-hosting using WordPress.org. So if you're a novice, uh, web designer for your own classroom, you could consider starting off with WordPress.com just with the understanding that there's something's a bit of a challenge in going from .com to, to .org, and you want to plan ahead for that. So you've chosen, let's assume you've chosen WordPress for your system, and you have to now make a decision uh, about how you're going to move forward. Let's say you sign up for WordPress.org, you've created your site, and you're ready to load it up. Let's meet your brand new WordPress website for the first time. So there's your little infant WordPress website right there to meet you. And your site 
may not look like what you've expected for a classroom website. You may say, it doesn't look like what I as a teacher want for my kids. There's this banner on the top with pictures of trolleys driving around that has nothing to do with what I want. And I think it can get very overwhelming because it's so different from what you may have expected in your head or what your old website looked like. And that can be a tough pill to swallow. You need to have faith. You need to make a leap of faith and say, I'm going to give it some time. I'm going to start to put in my content. I will get it looking like what I want. You really have to just force yourself to have that patience because it can get a little overwhelming. But you do have to make some decisions also. The big decision is almost which came first, the chicken or the egg. Which is going to come first, your content or the theme or the design? A lot of teachers are really eager to say, well, this site looks nothing like what I want. So I'm going to really start looking at the list of themes. And it's awfully tempting to start with that. But you really need to have some of your content figured out. And moreover, you should be planning your content even before you register for your WordPress site. You need to plan what sorts of information am I going to put up? What pages am I going to want to have? Am I going to have a page of class policies? How is that going to be organized? One site that I, or one uh, piece of software that I love using for planning out websites, essentially making almost a site map that you're planning, is Inspiration. If you're at the K-12 level, you may have some experience with Inspiration, a concept mapping software. That's a really great resource for you to plan out how your class website is going to function so that when you go to make it, you know exactly what pages you want. You know whether or not you're going to want to have a blog, where that blog is going to be positioned, or you can have a media gallery. You can have all of that figured out in advance, so then you can start putting in your content and then figuring out your theme. The truth of the matter is, though, when deciding whether you want theme first or content first, you do need a bit of both. While I'm really pushing towards the content first, uh, you do need to have some eye on how it's going to look. You have to decide, am I going to want a header? Am I not going to want a header? Just that you can plan in terms of what kind of content you're going to pull together for that. You want to have a thought in your head about what you're going to want. So plan a little bit about that, but begin by adding in at least a bit of content. I'm going to show you an example right now of a website that a colleague of mine asked me to help her to make. She wanted a new class website, so I suggested WordPress.com as a uh, starting point for her. She really wanted to get the look of it done first because she had that same adverse reaction when she saw the uh, 2011 theme on her site, she was kind of concerned that it didn't look the way she expected. So she really wanted to pick a theme first. So we looked through and finally she settled on this theme right here. Uh, it's called A Brand New Day. And it's a very nice theme. It's a great fit for a school. And she picked that. And then she realized that she had to now come up with the content to fit that theme. And that became a bit of a challenge because she didn't want to have a blog. So she didn't have a nice long page on the uh, front to welcome her visitors, and we needed to come up with something here that was tall enough to lead from the header all the way down to the footer, because we couldn't get the page to be any thinner. So we had to come up with this graphic of her kids' faces. She found a poem that she wanted to post up there. But it was a little bit of a challenge coming up with that organization. Now also, she had these menu uh, buttons right here to link to different pages, and we knew what we wanted here, but she didn't want to have a horizontal, I don't know what we call it, drop over menu, I guess, where it would extend further out as you hover to get into the nested pages. So we had to make an, uh, a custom menu with links. When you click on reading, there wasn't any content on the main reading page. Instead, we put links to the, uh, the subordinate pages within there. And we got it working for her. We got her content set up, and it worked out fine. It just was a bit of a challenge, and that's why I really stress. Choose what kind of a content piece you're going to want first, and then come up with the theme of your website. So when it comes to adding some real content, you should really consider populating your site with the actual content you're going to want to have. If you're going to have a page that shows your curriculum, don't double your efforts and put up a page that says curriculum goes here. Go to your district site, pull the curriculum, and actually put it up on your website. Make your work efficient and add the content from the beginning rather than going back. Now having said that, sometimes you just aren't ready to have that content. And there's a uh, great site uh, called the Lorem Ipsum Generator. That link is on my website that I'll show you in a little bit. And Lorem Ipsum is kind of the standard stock uh, content 
to use as a placeholder. So if you want to see how your blog is going to look on your website and get some ideas about how my site's going to appear with five blog posts on the main page, you can always make some fake, uh, fake posts using the lorem ipsum stock content just to get some text up there. Now let's take a look at moving forward. What some of your next steps might be now that you have your website, now that you hopefully have your content up, and now that you're starting to add some theme. Uh, I'm sorry, now that you're starting to add your content. With your site populated with initial content, you certainly can pick a final theme. I put an asterisk next to that just because you're never locked into a theme. You should, as a matter of good practice, reevaluate your theme every now and then just to see if it still meets with your needs. As you are looking to put in more functionality to your website, maybe there's some widgets that you're really interested in, you should give some consideration to does your theme continue to meet your needs or do you want to reevaluate that? You want to explore the features that come with your theme. Some themes just affect the visual qualities of WordPress, and that's fine. But some themes do give you some more options to customize, and that could be a really nice help to you as you're populating your site with content and uh, designing the user experience. There are plenty of settings, of course, in the administration uh, and the admin panel. Settings, theme options, widgets, and you really should take some time to go through and look at all of those different options. It's not scary. It looks overwhelming. I understand that it can be intimidating at first, but really when you look at it, there's a choice. It uh, will explain to you what the consequences are of that choice, what the options are. It's really something worth looking at and becoming familiar with, because you can really optimize your site just with spending 20 minutes looking into the different options. You should consider some plugins that would be helpful to you. There are a ton of plugins that are available uh, on the internet on uh, WordPress.org site that you can pull into your website. Some of them are really terrific. Some of them are more of a cute factor or a gag factor, but it's worth looking at because a lot of them can really help out your website. You do, however, as uh, Jess Jurek did mention yesterday in her presentation, you want to avoid plugins that replicate the core functionality of WordPress. WordPress is carefully designed. It can do a lot of things. You want to look at plugins that extend the functionality, not just ones that duplicate what it can already do. So there are a bunch of plugins that I can recommend to you for a class website. One big one, which I'd imagine many of you are familiar with, is Akismet. It uh, blocks spam coming into your site uh, through comments, uh, and that's a great feature. There's BB Press. It gives you basic form options. I started using that last year, and I'll show you how we uh, put it into practice. But it's not going to give you a full bulletin board system, but it'll give you some initial options to kind of broach the idea of discussion groups with your students. And my kids really enjoyed this. There's Fast Secure Contact Forms. That's a great, great resource. If you teach elementary or intermediate level schools, not all of your kids have email. It seems that a lot of my fourth graders, more of them have Facebook accounts than email addresses, but I guess that's where we are. And as a school, we're going to have to start to make that shift. Apparently, they're all 13 and can legally have their Facebook accounts. <laughs> But the Fast Secure Contact Form is a great way for students who go to your website to contact you if they have a question. It's also great if they're using a computer in your classroom and you want them to submit an assignment, let's say. It's just a great tool for kids to message you, and you can be really creative in how you use that. I'll show you some examples in a few moments. There's MCE Table Buttons, a terrific plugin created by one of our great developers here, Jay Goldman, over from 10UP. Uh, MCE Table Buttons will let you easily structure a table on a WordPress post, which seems pretty basic. Table, I can do it very quickly in Microsoft Word, and it's a little more complicated in WordPress. This plugin makes it just as simple as it is in Word, and it's really handy. I post on my website uh, my parent-teacher conference schedule. If you're a K-12 teacher, you know what a pain it is when you have parents who want to schedule an appointment and reschedule them. They want to know what open blocks you have. So I tell parents, here's where you go to view the schedule. It's a password-protected page, but they all have the password for it. Here's where you go to view the page. Here's my schedule. If you want an open time block, email me and I'll plug it in. And what you see on the website is my actual schedule. It saves me a lot of time and the uh, tables plugin is a big help for that. There's quote comments. If you start to have discussions going on on your website, that these are the actual names of the plugins, just to be clear. If you have discussions going on with your students on the class website, one of the challenges that I quickly found is when they're responding to one another and it's just comment after comment after comment after comment, you may have one student who's commenting on another student's comment which is 50 posts earlier. And it can be a big challenge. And there certainly are options to nest your comments, which is one of the things that I'm looking into for next year. But 
This is an option just to let them quickly quote the prior comments so you can at least see what they're responding to. I would recommend a nested comments as an even better option. Like I said, that's one of my next tasks to look into. Simple page ordering is another great plugin that I like, so that if you have multiple pages, it lets you structure what order they're going to appear in your uh, sidebar for users so that uh, you can really get precise control. So if it's parent-teacher conference season, and you want to move that parent-teacher conference page right to the top of your sidebar so that parents can easily find it, you can very easily do that. You also can put in the snowstorm plugin. This is the one that I know will make developers and designers cringe because this is the pure cutesy factor. I uh, have this put in and I enable it whenever we have a snow day because I will sometimes put up snow day activities for kids just to keep them. And it can be as simple as, hey guys, here's a funny YouTube video about tessellations or something you can watch. Uh, but I turn that on just, just to add to the cute factor for the kids. Uh, there's also WordPress Hide Post, WP Hide Post, it's actually called, and that is a huge, huge help. That hides both posts as well as pages, so if you want to be able to link to them and use them on your website, but you don't want them to show up in the sidebar, you don't want to show them to show up in menus, it's a great option for having them, but you control exactly how to link to them, since when you mark something as private, uh, it's not available to the users who don't have accounts. So this gives you a lot of different options. <coughs> So let me show you a couple of different examples. Here's my class website, and right over here on my website, I'm gonna get over here, just bear with me for one second. Please don't judge, it's not out of date, we checked, I don't know why my hosting service thinks my site's out of date. So here's my blog right over here, and you can see I've got uh, content going all the way down. I really wish that I had more uh, visuals in my blog posts, but we all know how it is towards the end of the school year, sometimes you just need to get the content up there. I've got class updates, I've got assignments on here for students, I have links to other materials to reinforce activities. Uh, this year I started putting on uh, online, actually last year, online homework assignments. They're simple games online, but if you're going to give a worksheet, you might as well let them do it as a fun game online. Uh, I also started using an app on my uh, iPad uh, called Show Me, and it lets you essentially do a screen recording of what you're teaching. So in this case, I uh, recorded a bunch of different videos during the school year just to walk the kids through lots of different activities. And these are all posted on our class website for kids to be able to access. So there are a lot of different features that you can put into your blog. One advantage of it is that your new content is highlighted right at the top of your page. They know that when they come to your website, the newest stuff is right up there ready for you. But at the same time, there's a disadvantage. That older content does tend to get lost at the bottom half of the page. If you're posting your links and assignments as blog posts, it's not going to be as easy to archive them and keep them available. One of my tasks to kind of look into this summer is both to organize my posts better, because I unfortunately never started to uh, organize them in different categories, and now it feels very late to do it, so I need to kick in and begin doing that, but also to make my links that I post for online assignments also part of my link role, uh, so that I can have it uh, ongoing, uh, so that I can maintain ongoing accessibility for my students. Let me also show you that you can put some text boxes on the sidebar of your page, and that's helpful. You can certainly just put in text right over here, but you can also put in plenty of other things, including HTML. We have a Number the Stars discussion group, or I should say we had a Number the, the Stars discussion form on our website. So I put in a text box, and then put in the image of the book cover, which linked to our discussion form. Right over here, we have a, a money raised for a charity that we support, and that's one that's always updated. This is just the site pages here in the calendar that comes with your posts, your archives. Here's another text box. We're pulling in a widget. Uh, we have a weather bug station on our roofs so that's pulled in and put right there on our sidebar for the students. And as I said, here's another text box. So text boxes can really do quite a bit more. I also use a text box for a countdown feature to make your deadlines in class so that they can see how many weeks, days, hours, minutes seconds they have leading up to a hard deadline in class and that's a great tool and whenever I'm using that that goes on the very very top uh, of the web page for easy access I mentioned before that we started some discussion groups so clicking on the number the stars book cover will take you over maybe 
it's working on here. It'll take you over to our discussion page right over there. Now, I did discussion groups in a lot of different ways. It was an experiment for me because, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm really hesitant to allow online discussions on my website. And if you're familiar with Number of the Stars, you know that there's no sensitive content whatsoever in that book, of course. If you're not familiar with it, it's a book about uh, the resistance trying to help uh, Jews in uh, is it Den Denmark, Jews in Denmark during the Holocaust. So very sensitive content in that book. And that's the one that I chose to start online discussions, and I was blown away by what a great job my kids did. And I remember that the whole process, I kept thinking, why didn't I start this months ago? We sometimes, not even sometimes, we were almost always having better discussions on the website than we were in class, because there was no issue of wait time. In class, you ask a student a question, and sure, you've got that big population of students who can respond immediately, but there's that population of students that needs that extra time to really sit there, think about what's being discussed, and formulate a response. As good teachers, of course, we want to provide as much time as we can for that. But on an online discussion group, there's unlimited time, and no one's standing there staring at you waiting for your response. So the stress level goes down, and for a lot of kids, the quality of the response goes up. We had some outstanding discussions on it. Now, our first activity with these online discussions was... Um, having just basic comments. I enabled kids to post comments on a blog post. And like I said, we tended to get lost in some of those discussions. But I'll show you what one of the first ones was here. This is going to give me a link to our discussion. So our predictions about Alan here. And you'll notice we started off with 62 responses on that first day in a class of 24 students. So I was really happy with that response. The second day we tried it out a little bit differently. I set up students with their own account. And on day two, once they were starting to get into the routine here, we had 255 responses in one night, an average of 10 posts per student. They were really into this. And yes, you can see a lot of them were, oops, sorry, forgot to log in, see you at school. I set the kids up on the second day with accounts, and it dynamically created their own avatars using, I think it's called the Monster plugin, or something. Uh, not, a, not even a plugin, it's part of the initial WordPress setup. The kids loved it, because everyone's was a little bit different. They didn't get to create it. It was a level playing field. And they were having such a fun time saying, oh, I love your monster. Oh, yours is really cool, too. Big piece is, of course, the motivation. We want to get kids excited about doing these activities. And that little quick setting, one button to click to set up that avatar, made a huge difference for my students. And they were really excited about it. The kids really enjoyed commenting. Uh, we then added some threads using the forum features. So if I go back over here, it's grayed out only because they're all close to new comments. But you can see day three, I had three different discussions going on simultaneously. That's when I started, this is the BD Press plugin. That's when I started using this forum because it just made it a lot easier for me, to reg uh, for me to organize three different discussions going on simultaneously. It would have been much more complicated if we were just commenting on individual blog posts. Finally, that's when I set in the plugin to allow quote replies just to make it a little bit easier. Uh, I don't think you got the job done totally. And my next step for next year is to look into using BuddyPress as a way to really facilitate this online discuss uh, this dis online discussion with my students. So the discussion groups were a uh, big advantage for me. I have over here my site pages. These are quick and easy to add. Uh, in the WordPress admin control. You can put in a lot of different sorts of things. You can always put in your parent-teacher conference schedule, like I was saying. If I wasn't, oh, it's actually asking me for the password right here. And that's a terrific resource, so that if there's a gray area in your district about, let's say, using names, but you want to put up a, cla uh, a class list for birthdays or for Valentine cards or whatever, maybe you can password protect it. I hope I have the right password here. We do. And this is using the uh, table buttons plugin. Uh, and it's an easy way just to set up your conference schedule. And as I said, I just tell parents, go over there and see what my available slots are and pick them up. Uh, that's a great tool for you to use to keep your information organized and accessible. You can see that I can nest pages in a hierarchy here. So I have my page of parent resources. And within that, we've got the conference schedule, uh, class policies, our class schedule in terms of specials, and so forth. So I've got my spelling words page. Let's take a look at my spelling words page. Oop. Did you see what it said there? Coming soon. It's been coming soon for three years. <laughs> and here's my simple reason why. 
WordPress is great for doing so many different things, but you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Our spelling series is available on the publisher's website. I send the kids to the publisher's website to download the spelling words when they need them. Why should I take the time to post them here if a simple link to another person's website is going to help you? And that's a really important thing to remember with WordPress, is the idea that whether it's WordPress or another form, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So if your whole team is posting a project and you want to put up the rubric for that, yes, everyone can upload it on their website, but really good planning will help you to say, if I'm on a fourth grade team, we're going to have a team page for all these shared resources, then each teacher will have their own site uh, for custom resources that are unique to our class. WordPress multi-site is a really great tool to help you to be more organized, but the idea of developing communal resources rather than everyone replicating each other's is a really key factor here. Now, I also like using my website as a landing pad for students. When we go down into the computer lab and I need to have them go to a different website for certain activities, I start off having them go to my website and the top post will be the information about where they should go. I want my website to be a hub for students so that if it's anything online relating to their school experience, they go to my website. They know exactly where to go and where to access it. So for example, we have under student resources computer CCLS activities. That's cross-curricular learning station. So when they're at the computer station, here are all the activities that they can do rather than using the favorites menu in Internet Explorer in there uh, on our school computers. We send them to our website, all the information is right here, and this is also where I have that uh, form tool for them to be able to message me. Uh, I believe if memory serves, Jetpack now also offers one. I don't know if anyone can confirm that, a contact form. I know also Google Forms will also. I think Jetpack will. But this is a really great one. I've been happy with it. I don't get any spam through it, and it's really easy for the kids. What I like here is that the uh, uh, code here for them to be able to submit the uh, article. It's really easy to read. Some of them are really tough to decipher and you have to look at a few different ones. This one is really simple for kids to be able to figure out what letters they need to enter in here. And this is called what? This is called, what did I call it before? Um, Fast Secure. What? Fast Secure. Fast Secure Contact Form is the name of the plugin for that. So it's this all reinforces the idea that my website is always their home. And that's why I really suggest to you that you should buy a domain for yourself. Even if it points to your school's website, even if you have a website for your district, if I use my school's website, my URL would be www.avon.k12.ct.us slash tilde j moss. Fourth graders are not going to remember that. If you buy a domain, it's $10, $15 a year, you have it for the whole year, and you just redirect it to whatever your website is. And it really makes it much easier for kids. I'm going to kick it into high gear here because I know we're running out of time. You can have lots of different kinds of widgets on your site. Uh, Twitter feeds, Flickr streams, the Weatherbug plugin, lots of different things to extend the functionality of your website and to make it more helpful for your students. I have an educational technology website which I use to post videos of professional development workshops that I give and other sorts of resources. If you go over here to advantage.com, developing class websites with WordPress, you've got today's date, that's where you can go to find materials from today's session. I have right over here my tag cloud to show popular topics that I'm including on my website. You can certainly put those in on your class website and that's a great way for kids to be able to see, hey, What's really some of the interesting stuff that we're discussing? What are the big words right now that are most common? And they can see, oh, do you see this word got bigger and that word got smaller? You think they're not going to have those discussions, but especially if you work with some of the younger kids, you'll know they notice these things and they are interested in it. Right over here, I have the website uh, for the computer program that I'm running this summer. And you know, I'm glad that I put this here because you may be looking at that saying to yourself, wow, it's a mighty interesting theme there that you chose. It's a theme that works for me. Uh, it's not something that I want to spend an unlimited amount of time on right now. It gets the job done. My kids are excited. They like seeing themselves. They like seeing their different projects uh, up here, the work that they come up with under Camper Creations. I didn't want to spend a lot of time picking a theme. As time goes on, I may refine it. This is a installation using WordPress multi-site that allows you to have one overall installation and then several smaller installations within it. Uh, so we've got Advantage.com Renbrook, and then we have one group that made a fictional product, a TRS-80 port of Minecraft. 
That was their big keystone pro capstone project for the session. And you can see it looks totally separate. It looks as if it's an independent WordPress installation. These guys design this completely from scratch. But what's nice is it gives me the option to edit it, to go in as a super administrator, and to have uh, control over that as well. And that's a really great option if you're uh, a tech coordinator at a building level, or even a district level, and you're looking to give lots of different uh, websites out to people while still maintaining a certain amount of control over those. So my next steps here in the coming year, I want to take a look at using BuddyPress as a tool uh, for my website. I want to extend my use of multi-site maybe to other settings. I want to look at better categorizing my content, my links to make sure that I'm being very efficient on my site. I want to develop more of those communal resources with my team so that we're not all reinventing the wheel on our own independent websites. I want to look into different options that will facilitate my efforts to quickly and easily post content on my website. There are email based options that you just email your text and it goes up there. There are iOS apps, other resources. I want to look into more activity with student accounts, and I think it is time for me to reevaluate my theme. It doesn't meet the needs of what I'm looking to do right now. So, also looking at new plugins. I want to thank everyone for coming today. I'm John Moss. That's how you can get a hold of me. I want to thank BU for inviting us this year. Go Sox. If you have any questions for me, if you have any questions, sorry, if you have any questions for me, I know the next session is going to start. I'm right down in the happiness bar uh, after this session, so feel free to come find me and feel free to reach out to me online. Thank you all very, very much. <laughs>